Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave. Uh, and today's one day build, it is a one day build, uh, is a return to some one day builds we were doing last year and earlier this year, but kind of fell by the wayside because of COVID. Um, but it's time to say hello to an old friend. Spot, he's back on the bench. Why? Well, it's actually really exciting. And uh, we're gonna get into some fun spot mods. Today's one day build. Yeah, we're even going on a location shoot. What? So what are we gonna be doing with Spot today? Well, look, it's undeniable that a lot of people look at this guy and they think it's a little bit creepy. They they feel like it's a, uh, I think they feel like it's a little dystopic. And I do not. And I've said this in every Spot video, I see a magnificent piece of engineering, of engineering and incredible possibility for what it could do. Uh, but I know that some people look at that and they're like squicked out. So why? Well, I think part of it could be how Spot looks. And that's what today's One Day Build is about. It's about changing Spot's look. And I have a collaborator potential in the wings um, who shall remain nameless at this moment in time, but an incredible designer uh, who wants to help design a new skin for Spot. But as I was thinking about this collaboration, I was realizing it's not just about taking pictures of Spot and doing drawings on them necessarily because Spot moves. So whatever design changes we make, not only have to keep out of the way of the cameras and the radar systems, but also what do those forms that we may do to change his outward appearance do when he's moving? So today's one day build is, I'm going to be building a lot of different shape changers for Spot using corrugated cardboard and feathers and some other stuff. I'm gonna be experimenting with how those look on location. We're gonna go onto location with all the little doodads that I build today. And we're gonna do some like Moybridge style spot movement library shots. And this should help us get a much better bead on the things that we can do to change his appearance that alter one's aesthetic and hopefully even emotional experience of him. Yeah, that's today's one day build. Let's get started. Fire up the hot glue gun. Oh, actually the very first thing I'm gonna be doing is adding a bunch of Velcro to all of his exterior parts uh, in order to be able to stick on and remove these pieces. I got a whole bunch of two inch Velcro. So um, I'm gonna shut them off, sit them down, shut them off and start to work on them. I have uh, I've powered Spot down. I've powered his motors down so they can't move. So his legs are, uh, they can't harm me. Uh, it's still powered up right now. But little hint when using Velcro. Whatever you've got that faces outwards, use loop. Whatever you've got that faces inwards, use hook. Uh, NASA follows this on their spacesuits. Whatever is meant for stuff to stick on, loop is facing outwards and hook is facing inwards. That way you're not like dealing with the scratchy hook. All right, so.
I have completed some cardboard pieces. Uh, these are a very simple construction with a little bit of hook Velcro on them, and they connect to the arms, come soft. It's a lightweight connection, but that's fine. It's exactly what I wanted. Um, the spot is off, by the way. It's just sitting here. Uh, and Yep, and then um, I also have a couple of body forms that can attach stuff uh, to. And um, <laughs> I know, I know, it doesn't look like much. Um, hang on. <clears throat> so this is just for me to kind of get a feeling for what might work. Um, and it's actually based on a, the, the, what I'm doing here is a certain kind of problem solving that I learned a long time ago. Uh, yeah, it was like the early nineties. Um, I was making a piece of sculpture. I was at that point in the, like 91 or so, I was making tons of hands. Uh, here are some pictures of some of the hand sculptures I made back then. I was making a bunch of hands as sculptures, and I'd made this one that I really liked the look of. It, it was a good meaty hand, and it had the, the way uh, it was aesthetically, physically perfect, but I couldn't figure out what color it should be. And it sat on my workbench for a few days, and no color inspiration came, which I was unexpected to me. No, no guidance. And so I, I look at some stuff sometimes and like I instantly can see what color it should be. And if I don't, I just keep on building until something happens. But this was a hand sculpture. This was a sculpture in which the whole thing was done, but no color was making itself apparent to me. So I thought, I just don't know. I had this thought, I don't know. And then I had this other thought, which was, well, what if I did know something? Is there something that I know that can help guide me? And I thought, okay, uh, what, do I know what color it shouldn't be? It was just a random question I asked. Um, um, I was looking for something to latch onto, and I said to myself, do I know what color it shouldn't be? And it instantly in my head, what came up was, candy stripe, red and white spiral all the way down. And I was really clear that that was the worst possible choice for this sculpture. But because it was the only thing that I knew, that I knew for a fact, I was like, I'm gonna try painting a candy stripe. And I spent six hours masking it carefully and painting it candy stripe, red and white. And when I took the, the, the tape off, I don't have any pictures of this. When I took the tape off, it was instantly clear what color it wanted to be. And that was uh, the color I ended up painting in this rich, verdant uh, 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 green. The green of Portland, like the green of a place where it rains all the time, uh, England, like that kind of green, that rich green. I painted the sculpture that color and it was perfect. My friend Rhonda Robichaud uh, purchased it from me. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure she still has it. Uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. And I would have never latched onto that color had I not painted it the wrong color. So this is a technique I have used in the years since then, which is if I don't know, if I can't figure out the right path forward, I start assessing the things that I do know <clears throat> and attacking those one at a time. So in this, I don't know what form spot wants to take or you know what form I'm gonna feel like he should take. But I know that by gluing a bunch of weird random cardboard to him, I am likely to 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 
travel past some inspiration. Let's talk about inspiration as a physical landscape. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm taking a trip through some shapes in hopes that I pass by a road sign that says inspiration over here. Yeah. You don't know which, if you don't know what direction to go in, the fact is any direction is useful as long as you're doing it with purpose. Yeah. So it, it, this is, a, in a way, this is sort of like how I uh, keep from stagnating, right? I don't just sit there and wait for inspiration. I push the thing in a specific direction until the inspiration becomes clear. All right. I think I've explained that three times. I think I, uh, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> all this is also uh, a long way of explaining that I don't, I, nothing here is exciting me in terms of these shapes. They're just here as like, structural standards. Tomorrow I'm going to start playing around with some shapes and swoops and some other stuff. But right now, it's just, to me, it just looks like, it looks like I don't know what I'm doing. And the answer is, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I know what I'm trying. I know what the gulf should feel like. Um, but here it's just like, yeah, oh. <laughs> It's never easy in this spot, and it's never simple in this liminal space before you kind of have that moment. Uh, I also have made a couple of other pieces, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, I made an antenna. So there's a base. That's just some uh, Instacast poured into a PVC pipe and then laid on my lathe in a minute. This is a, uh, a glass panel light. I purchase these on eBay all the time because they're rare and hard to find and nothing looks better. Look at that thing. Oh, oh wait, I can light it up for you. Hold on. Um, hang on. It's, uh, oh, there we go. Boop. Oh, yeah, right? That is nice and bright. How did I get it so bright? Because none of my LEDs are quite this bright. I took this industrial flashlight that I found for three bucks and I literally soldered to its little head. Uh, and because it's a single AA battery, I made it all integrated. So this is also, I'm um, actually, hold on, put this away. This is um, just gonna sit there. And I'm just curious about what kind of movement an antenna does when he walks. Yeah, I kind of have this image in my head of him having a couple of antennas. So I'm building a second one. And that as he moves, they kind of rock back and forth like the Mondo Shawan uh, from that shot at the beginning of the fifth element. But I, this is all just data gathering. That's what it is, it's data gathering. I'm gonna cut some more cardboard and make some more antennas and get things ready for the location shoot. I'm actually, none of the actual shape problem solving is gonna happen here. I'm just going to be making shapes here. All the actual in situ uh, uh, explorations will happen on the location. It's just only a few minutes away in this video, but for me, it's like two whole days. Here is my second antenna. This is just the head of that industrial flashlight, sorry, uh, consumer uh, triple, double A flashlight stuck to the end of a piece of polyethylene, I think. And I'm just gonna thread the wire through it. Oh, right, let's do a test of the circuit. And why not frame me in the center while we're at it? During the time lapses, the music I'm listening to today is the um, soundtrack to The Mandalorian. Yep. Oh man, I still, can I say I still love this soldering iron? This uh, one that runs off my DeWalt batteries. All right, let's do a quick, uh, quick test, system test. If I got this right. Hey, there we go. Oh, <laughs> you can't even see it. <laughs> Uh, and you still can't see it because I don't have the light in it. There we go. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Nice. I like that. Um, I need to put on, I need to tape on my glass panel light. I would use a red one because it's a little brighter than the green, but I don't have any red ones left. Oh, I do have a red one, but it's like gigantic. It's like the size of a cow eyeball. Why would I use that as a size reference? I've never even... No, I have touched a cow eyeball. 
not on a living cow. I am not gluing these in because these panel lights, uh, this isn't the last thing that they do. I am literally only using my panel lights temporarily. Um, these are the kind of beautiful objects I save for a rainy day. And by rainy day, I mean a thing I want to build that is more beautiful because of them. Uh, so I am, normally I would glue such a thing, but today I will not because I want to reuse it someday. All right, let's see. I can still get this battery going. Yep, yep, there we go. That is a light. Oh yeah, it's a good nostril inspection light. One thing that is really tough about the cell stick Velcro, <clears throat> man, it sticks to everything, which is great, but it also sticks to your scissors, which means every time you use a pair of scissors to work with the Velcro, you want to take a little bit of acetone or Bestine and clean the gummo off the off the blades because they yeah they just start messing with your persuasion immediately All right, so. yeah the, the gum on this velcro is super tenacious which is good you want it that way but you just don't want it sticking to your tools this is just me attaching a little velcro to help these body forms stay on i want to label this So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually cut off I definitely want some stickum back here for antennae. Head. I want I want a head. I want um some kind of neck, some kind of neck. Okay. I have a head that I was thinking of playing around with this and it's this guy, it's this lizard. Yeah, because I know that like there's that horse head mask and I was on Amazon and I searched animal mask and I found this one. Which is kind of awesome. And it struck me as like, I haven't seen one of these. Oh man, is this eye actually moving? No, it's not, but it really looks like it moves. Wow. Uh, so anyway, I was thinking of this, right? I mean, yeah, I, I gotta try the animal thing. I have to, I gotta, I, I got I'm not sure I want a head on this thing. I'm very not sure, but I am sure that I want to try it. The shop is suitably a mess. I have packed my car and I'm now taking all the cardboard bits and bobs and greeblies and nurnies for spot. And they're loaded into my car out front. And I'm about to take them out on location where we're gonna we're gonna work our show, work ourselves through a taxonomy of spot forms. Yeah, I am super excited about today. A note about the footage you're about to see. Uh, you're gonna see me working directly with Spot and close to him. Uh, and I'm gonna look like I'm comfortable. And that's because I am. That comfort is based on a year of institutional knowledge built on working directly with the wonder that is Spot. Um, if you think that I'm being cavalier in terms of my proximity to him, know that nothing could be farther from the truth. All of us here at Tested, as we have worked with Spot, are very cognizant of the dangers and are being incredibly careful when we're around him while his motors are powered. With that being said, let's get to the location. All right. That's the last of his bits and bobs. Where is Spot? Spot! Come on! Come right here. Come here, come on. Right here. Perfect, stop. Excellent. 
Okay, so uh, I have here some basic rudiments of stuff to put on spot. I have three different leg designs, and these are clunky on purpose. They're meant to just stick there and let me see what he looks like with different shapes on him. I'll also be using a hot glue gun to potentially add cardboard to these to kind of change their shape. And then I also have um, a back, uh, which sits there, and I can stick the antenna on the back. I can, uh, oh. I put hook Velcro and hook Velcro on both sides of that equation. That's why that didn't work. I have here a neck. This I'm excited about because I've got some head options to put up here. Oh my God, it's totally weird. Okay, that's I'm saving that because that's gonna be really weird and cool. Um, I'm hoping to get like six or seven different looks today. That's my goal. Six or seven kind of radically different ideas of form around Spot's body. And I think I'm gonna start with the clunkiest possible thing, which is like these guys. Wanna see. Yeah, this is weird, but I just want to see it. Oh, he doesn't like that. <laughs> okay, so these mess with his, with his ability to see. But what do they do on the back? No. <laughs> no. No, no, no. He definitely, that's, that's, does, does not work. Okay. Let's definitely get this shot. It's not awesome, but it's sort of like the first step. I think this is the first, uh, let's just try looking what he looks like on a walk, uh, on a walking sequence with this. Because what we're doing today is effectively a set of motion studies, we've put lines on the wall, not just because I love lines on the wall from my Mythbuster days, but also because the very first motion studies ever done by Edward Muybridge, effectively the inventor of cinema, uh, were done in this same way with people against a gridded background. And I wanted the same thing for my taxonomy of spot movement. Ah, yes, okay, so these are out. These don't work, they're too bulky. It's the first thing I've learned. And this is what this whole exercise was, was to learn what immediately works and what doesn't and then give me ideas about where to go with it. Big shoulders, number one, they get in the way of his vision abilities, um, but they also, frankly, he looks a lot friendlier when his body's a little bigger, but his legs stay the same to me. Um, however, I have a set of smaller legs. So let's try these. I'm gonna let him rest for a minute. There's another thing I wanna try. I wanna try sneakers on spot. Uh, I believe he wears size six, 18 to 24 months toddler shoes. Look at how cute these are. I've turned off his motors. Okay. Apparently one of the tougher engineering challenges on spot was the specific material science of his 
feet because they got to act like shoes, right? They have to be this very durable kind of rubber. Yeah. So this may change him a little bit, but I also, it's going to change his perception a lot, I think. We have a new modification of the shortest story ever. For sale, baby shoes, only worn once by a robot. Ah, uh, well, I guess we're just gonna learn how he deals. I kind of, I'm nervous about him pulling the shoes off, just standing up. So I'm gonna kind of get him into a close position. Yeah, all right. Now, turning on his motor. It's sort of funny to me that it, I spent 10 or 12 hours making a whole bunch of little cardboard things and thinking about his look and the sneakers have done more than anything I could have conceived to alter his character. I'm a little afraid that the moment I start him walking, he's just gonna like kick them all off like any toddler. <laughs> ah, but here we go. <laughs> the feet are the feet are so important. Just seeing feet. Just seeing like the anatomy on this is making such a huge difference. I know they need to be balls, but you could easily do something like this and it wouldn't affect him too much. God, that's great. I'm gonna leave them on until they fall off. I, I really dig these. That's my first part of this that I'm like, yes, feet, A-okay. Uh, it's time to visit this neck of the woods. <laughs> oh, I have steadfastly resisted doing this because I'm not sure I think there should be faces on our robots. So I bought the most robot-like face I could think of, which is a lizard. I must admit, I'm surprised by how much I like the head and the neck. I am curious about changing its form factor slightly. Uh, and I think that's the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut away some of that cardboard and make it a leaner, finer neck and see how that changes the look. Oh, Dr. Demento. <laughs> That's a leaner neck. I have another creature head. It's not nearly as warm and inviting as the lizard. <laughs> but it's worth trying. Got this Cthulhu mask that I bought a while back on Etsy. I was just curious, you know, I'm gonna add more sympathetic movement just because I'm curious about what it could look like. I'm making a bunch of like, it's like I'm making a mythical creature that an eight-year-old would draw.
The feathers, the feathers were interesting, but I don't think they add anything. Except I really like the ears. The reason I went with this blocky head is because I wanted to see the difference between like a personifiable head and clearly like a mechanical head. And I'm here to say I don't mind the straight mechanical head. I, I don't put any narrative onto this. So it's less cute, but for my money, that's actually kind of better. Um, I am gonna shorten the head. I'm gonna bring it down to here and see how I like it there. I just wanna look at both iterations. It's a really interesting question here because there's a lot we can play with. He, the head could go here, it could go here. See the difference? It can't go here. That just looks like he's looking behind him and that's just like, this is all about what your immediate intuition of the robot is, right? You make all of these assessments. So I love playing around with this cute, not cute, animal, not animal kind of metric. And actually, I think proportionally, that's better. Yeah, he's smaller. Just interested in slightly bigger, bigger back, that's all. Again, all this is just to build a library. I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm actually trying to figure out how to start solving the problem. That's what this is all about. A taxonomy of form. I like those ears. <laughs> it feels great. <laughs> I didn't expect to like this look so much. We've got a very animalistic kind of small deer kind of look. Even with this boxy head and a camera for a nose, I'm sort of impressed how much I like this. I still don't know that this is how robots should look, but you know, I was playing around with forms and this is a form that appeals to me. I'm gonna try this one. And I think after this, I may go with a much less animal-like neck and see how I like that. And then I think, I think I've got all the information I currently need for this iteration. little helpful hint. Every glue gun can be cordless for a little while. I love the sensitivity with which he does the reverse jog. Now, I'm gonna take everything off. I'm gonna do one more walk cycle naked because now I have a whole bunch of information, a whole bunch of data about what he looks like with different types of stuff on his body. 
I want to go back to the beginning and look at him without anything. <laughs> That's it. Uh, no, I'm going to leave the shoes on. So as I'm looking at him without anything on him, I'm noticing there's a very specific thing that I'm doing when I regard him, which is if he has nothing else on him, I think of this as the face. And it's a weird place for a face because <sighs> it's not how animals, it's not where we put our faces evolutionarily. Um, so that's one thing that's right there pretty interesting to me, that as I move him around, yeah, it's like I need him to have some base of operations that's not here. That's, that's pretty clear to me after looking at him under all these parameters, and that's not what I expected. I mean, I still see when I look at this, it's not creepy even one iota. I just think of it as beautiful, efficient, Gorgeous engineering. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it's just really clear to me that that's a weird place for a head. And it's where I'm putting his head mentally. And I didn't realize that until I put it somewhere else and tried this out. That right there is, that's worth the price of admission. Today was like a good day in dialing into this. Look, I know that we didn't build a beautiful robot today, but that was never the point. He's already a beautiful robot. Um, no, the point today was to understand how Spot looks under all sorts of different parameters. And in that, it was a huge success. And it's actually crazy educational to have added all this bulk to him in different formats and then see him naked again. Helps me understand some of the ways in which people perceive him because he's literally built as small as he can be so that functionality can be added. And I think of his fascia as part of his functionality. As far as continuing from what we've learned today, I don't think I'm a good enough designer. Uh, it's not what I do professionally. Yes, I can design stuff, but I think I need someone with a, a solid background in character design with a crossover in industrial design to take a look at the taxonomy that we've built and take Spot to the next level. But that's not this video. That's definitely another future video. Thank you guys for joining me for this really educational and frequently hilarious one day build. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching that video. If you'd like to further support us on Tested, there are many ways you can do so. One is through paid membership, and there are several tiers of that, each with their own set of unique bonuses. You can follow the links below for that, or you can go to our merch store where we are always coming up with brand new products. In honor of the holidays, we've got our Tested Ugly sweater in both black and we have a white one. We have some brand new patches and this is a particular type that I made a joke about one day and now it's a reality. You know about merit badges. When you're a Cub Scout or a Boy Scout, you get a merit badge for achieving something. Well, Tested now has demerit badges for when you screw something up because that's just as important in learning as getting something right. So this is the badge for when you measure something once and have to cut it twice. <laughs> this is the badge for when you accidentally hook up your electronics wrong and you release the mysterious blue smoke that powers them and they no longer work. 
And this one here is for when you get your finger caught in the lathe and it almost gets torn off. That might be quite me specific. I hope that never happens to you. These are all designed by Tested's own Jen Schachter and they are not the only patches we're gonna release. In fact, these are just the beginning. If you have ideas for demerit badges that we should release, we'd love to hear them. We also still have our regular complement of posters and they're all back in stock, including my hand-drawn toolboxes, I love seeing pictures you guys send us of these hanging in your maker spaces and your offices, your man caves and your sheds around the world. Get to the store, follow the links below, and hey, some of these might make great Christmas presents for the makers in your life. Thanks you guys, happy holidays.